Good afternoon. A warm welcome to Conversations. My name is Emily Butler. I'm the Conversations Curator. We're, I can't wait to hear today from our panelists who are going to uh, reflect and consider uh, measures of success, economic success, before, beyond economic growth. We're really thrilled to welcome four uh, specialists who are going to offer their views today. So we've got gallerist Omara Al Alvarado Jensen, who's the Executive Director of the Instituto División, uh, that is based uh, both in Bogota, is that right, and Los Angeles. And Leopold José María Mones Casson, who's the director of the Isla Flontante Gallery, which is based in Buenos Aires. Uh, Anna Raginaskaya, who's the Investing with Impact director at the Blue Rider Group at Morgan Stanley. And Felix Salmon, who's the chief financial correspondent uh, for Axios and a po podcast host for Slate Money. We're really delighted uh, that we have Tim Schneider, who's moderating the panel for us today. He's the art bus business editor at Artnet News, and he's also the co-curator of this panel. So the conversation will last approximately 50 minutes, and we'll have 10 minutes of questions at the end. We'll be passing a mic around the room, so feel free to put your hands up. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tim. Do please give our uh, speakers today a very warm round of applause and enjoy the conversation. Thanks, Emily. So we are going to try to cover a lot of ground in this discussion, but the main question, as Emily sort of nodded to, was the idea of how is it that you stay on track for growth, however you want to define that, when the circumstances that you're facing are less than ideal? And they could be less than ideal because of the larger economic situation. They could be less than ideal because of the circumstances that you're starting off in or any combination of any number of other things, but we are hugely fortunate to have just a really diverse set of viewpoints up here. So we'll, I think, be able to give you, if not like a holistic view, excuse me, holistic view of the answers, certainly a very rich and varied one. So I'm just gonna kind of dive right into it with everybody. And since we're bringing together such a range of different specialties and points of view, I just wanna start off by going around to our various panelists and asking each of you to give just a brief overview of the kind of specific context or background you're working from. So Felix, since your image was the one that was used online for this panel, I'm going to start I, I, off I, 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 with I personally, you. I personally, like, am, I am the face of this panel. You are the poster boy, <laughs> really. So, I, and this is a fun question for me to ask you to answer in, like, a succinct manner, but how would you summarize the state of the U.S. economy right now? <laughs> um, I, I'd say kind of um, fair to middling. Um, a lot of people are freaked out. A lot of the markets are kind of freaked out about interest rate -y stuff. And the interest rates are, to be clear, incredibly important for the art market, much more important for the art market than they are for the broader economy. So um, it, like the, as, as far as art collectors are concerned, the rise in interest rates is, is a very big deal because, as you all know, um, art doesn't cash flow, you know, it doesn't... Um, uh, pay any interest in terms of money. Um, and that's fine when interest rates are at zero because nothing pays any interest rates. And that's where we were for, you know, the past 12 years, something like that. Now we have interest rates again. And so in, in comparison to things that are paying money, like, you know, bonds and savings accounts or anything else, uh, actually looks less attractive, but in general, the economy seems to be holding up. You know, we have very low unemployment, we have relatively strong economic growth. We just had a new GDP number out yesterday that was stronger than we thought it was for the second quarter. Um, the Fed is trying to slow things down and kind of isn't succeeding, is what I would say. So um, this is, I have definitely seen much worse economies than this. That's a sobering thought in and of itself. Um, to switch gears a little bit, Omira, can you kind of just give our audience who may not know as much, uh, just like, what are the main points that they should know about like the collecting landscape and the institutional landscape in Colombia right now? Hello, everyone. Um, as we discussed before, Colombia, it's, um, it has a small market uh, in that sense, um, and that is why we are 
trying to expand uh, to other regions, especially the U.S., but um, Colombia has been a very conservative uh, country, and most of the collectors tend to go that way, so contemporary art can be a little bit of a struggle. Um, and although the, we have young collectors who are brothering their um, ideas of collecting, uh, institution-wise, we do have uh, a big gap. We really only have two museums who are building a real collection with an incredible curatorial view that they're actually supporting a lot. And they were very key during the pandemic for uh, they really focus, especially Banco de la Republica, who's the biggest institution. Um, they really supported artists. They were like, we're stopping any other, collect, uh, collecting any other artists that are not Colombian, because they were broadening in Latin America and doing a very interesting job. But they decided to focus their collecting activities for national artists, which was great. Uh, and it's been a great support for the ecosystem in Colombia. And the other museum is a Museum of uh, Modern Art in Medellin, who started also a group of uh, friends of the museum, and they do a significant purchase uh, two times a year. So those two institutions are the real ones who are uh, supporting the market, but that's not enough. <laughs> so it, is, uh, it can be a struggle when you have um, a small collecting uh, market and a small institutions. Yeah, and just for further context too, and this is something I learned during the course of researching this, I mean, Colombia I think is the fourth largest economy in South America, or Latin America, I can't remember, but so it's, it's a pretty strong place, economically speaking, so the fact that it has these challenges still in the collecting sense is a little bit dissonant and, and interesting, and I'm sure we'll dig into that more. Uh, Leopold, just to stay up on this tip, how does that compare to what's happening in Argentina? Well, thank you, Tim. Um, <clears throat> the, the situation is not that different. In, in Argentina, we have a very precarious uh, system. Even though we have a very uh, high production of art, many, many artists around the whole country, the system is still underdeveloped. So. Uh, uh, that's why we lack, you know, of, of money, institutions, lack of money, lack of institutional programs of acquisitions. Even though they make an effort, every, every, most of the, of the things, most of the relationships are based on individuals and not institutionally ba based. So um, that's an important thing we addressed within the gallery and within our colleagues in, in Argentina. So. We formed uh, like six years ago a gallery association that help, is helping a lot to begin the discussions of institutionalization, you know, and get rid of this precariousness on the art system. And then just to round this out, Anna, can you tell us a little bit about the current state of arts philanthropy in the US? Sure, happily. I think for context, just where my comments are situated from, I'm part of a small group at Morgan Stanley that works with clients across the art community. So my clients include both collectors as well as institutions um, on questions of financial services and investing, which has definitely been an interesting, um, in interesting in the past year. So our arts philanthropy has actually been relatively stagnant over the course of the last decade. About 4% of annual giving um, philanthropically in the US goes towards the arts every year, but that's a, uh, interestingly small piece when you think about how much arts funding is being cut from the public sector. So to put this into perspective, going back to 2001, um, there's about 40% less dollars going from state legislatures towards arts education, and we're not seeing concurrently private philanthropy coming in and filling that gap. So we do have both sort of a weakness as far as dollars going into the art world, but a more um, long-term problem that we're really seeing, which is around the next generation of donors who largely seem to be shifting their interests away from arts and culture, even if they come from families that have supported the arts for a long time, uh, and are now much more interested in questions of social justice, environmental issues. Um, a conversation that's very topical in the arts philanthropy landscape now is what arts institutions can do to continue to feel relevant in this climate. Um, I, for one, am a real believer that the arts um, have a 
very strong role to play both in environmental and social justice issues, but not all institutions are great at telling those stories. And just out of curiosity, Anna, in terms of if you have the money that's sort of not coming into arts philanthropy from this younger generation, like how does that compare to what you're seeing just anecdotally on like the for-profit side of things? Like, are these people not interested in collecting or, because it seems like, you know. I think they are very interested in collecting and I think you're seeing like certainly a lot of millennial interest in collecting, but I think they think of collecting as investing, so that's okay, mm -hmm. versus philanthropy is sort of n nice to have uh, and, and not required, and I think that um, the art world, like the old school version of the art world, I think really understood that relationship between institutions and why supporting institutions was an important aspect of collecting, and I think it's something that we're mindful of trying to continue to cultivate. I want to move on to this idea of art fairs and real estate, which are two of the main ways that galleries tend to think about growing and kind of expanding their presence in various ways. And Omira and Leopold, you've both done a pretty high amount of fairs annually for a long time. You can see the expression on your face and it just tells me volumes about what's been happening. Um, but you both pretty recently made the decision that you were gonna expand physically and permanently into another country. Can you talk a little bit about your new spaces and sort of what led you to believe that this was the right kind of thing to do after this more itinerant existence of the traveling art fair carnival? Okay, yes, uh, Tim, that's a decision we made within the gallery. Um, we are uh, expanding our business to Brazil, especially in Sao Paulo. We are firstly installing a, an office that is called an escritorio, and um, maybe in the, in the midterm, we're gonna have a, an exhibi exhibition program over there too. The decision came up uh, after some years of uh, visiting Sao Paulo, visiting Brazil, getting into the art fairs over there and making a much strong relationship with the actors over there. And now the gallery representing two Brazilian artists, one of them showing at the solo presentations in positions sections now. Um, we, th we think or we felt that this decision came up of a process of maturity, you know, that uh, um, you know, uh, Brazil is just two hour flight from Buenos Aires and it's a 150 bucks ticket. So it's kind of weird that if we have this strong market down there two hours away, uh, stay in Buenos Aires, just, you know, uh, living from that, from that tiny zine. And uh, that's not, a, it's not something, you know, negative because the gallery itself is sustainable just within the Argentinian market. But we feel that uh, to get deeper, you know, on the circulation of the ideas, we represent the artist's uh, careers. Uh, we really uh, feel, feel that we need to, be, to get abroad and Brazil is like a new, a new place that can, where we can cultivate a lot more. Myra? Um, yeah, we decided um, to open a space in New York. So we're now located in Bogota and New York. It's a permanent uh, gallery space. And we opened at the beginning of this year. And for us, it was very important to make this decision because, uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, Colombia is a small market. Uh, very, it's a very young collector um, history, uh, history of collecting, I'm sorry. And, um, and for us, since we started the gallery, um, it was always necessary to be on a plane, having, going to an art fair, because of the kind of artists that we uh, represent, the kind of topics we talk about. But also, as the gallery grew, our artists started growing and their necessities started growing. And uh, for us, um, it was a, there was a point when we decided that Bogota wasn't enough because we were putting these beautiful shows and we were getting very little reviews. Uh, like the amount of people that were really actually seeing these exhibitions was not up to what we were presenting. And personally, I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, my other business partner moved to uh, New York. 
and we are three female owners. Uh, two of my business partners are mothers, uh, so there's also family to take care of. And being on a plane and being in Arthur's all the time is very hard. Uh, so we decided it was very important after the pandemic to really think uh, where our market was. We understood that uh, the U.S. is their stronger base of collectors, and uh, this was the place for us to keep growing and keep uh, being able to show what we're doing and keep our conversations in a more permanent way with institutions, with private collectors. So, and we're super happy it has worked out. May I add something, Tim? Absolutely. Sorry. Um, yeah, because um, I must say that one of the one important factor that make us uh, make this decision is that we both both partners of the gallery we both love Sao Paulo and we both love to be there in the city with that energy uh, pumping over there and we feel this attraction has a lot of sense you know within our our program of the gallery so being in touch more frequently is gonna you know uh, get some good fruits in the future so it's much more than a feeling and a affection besides the economy part, you know. Felix, I'm curious to hear your perspective on the real estate angle here, because like this is something I never thought about until I started working in galleries when I was in my 20s, like just how much the gallery business is just an offshoot of the real estate business. <laughs> and it, coming at it from the direction that you would come at it from. I'm just like, do you see that there are any like hacks out there in terms of galleries that maybe don't have the financial resources of major players other than saying like, oh, we're just gonna team up on a space or we're gonna do pop-ups or stuff like that? Yes, space is a, a, a super important because they, it's how people remember things, right? Like you can walk around the exhibition hall downstairs and it's just booth after booth. If you want to build a relationship, people will, will remember going into a space, seeing a show in a certain place, seeing a series of shows, they start understanding the program much better. Um, there's massive advantages to having a space. The, you know, financially speaking, um, the whole business of having a gallery is just batshit. I wouldn't advise it to anyone. Um, like basically, Everything is negative cash flows, right? We, we, know, we know that art, you know, if you're sitting on art, it's, it, you have to store it, you have to insure it, you have to pay rent on your space. You ideally, if you're, you know, grow to become the kind of gallery you wanna be, you wanna be able to pay your artists monthly so they can pay rent, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and then against that, your inflows, you know, nothing happens every month, right? It's just like random, globs of sales and you want to be able to take your time over sales you want to be able to place things in the right place you want to be able to sell only at the right time and the most successful galleries in the world for, you know for as long as there have been galleries have been the ones with incredibly deep pockets who can afford to sit on art for decades if they need to and can bide their time and like sell the right right piece at the right time to the right person um, and build those relationships and so yeah that's if, if you're like young and new and you don't have super deep pockets, you can't do that. Like, I don't think there's some like clever hack that allows you to be able to have massive negative cash flows every month and then make it all up in the 20 years time, unless you want to finance that, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, tricky, right? But maybe a good segue, I think that's why nonprofit spaces are important because nonprofit spaces can rely on donations from the public as well as sales, and that's really the venue in a lot of places where riskier things can happen and artists can really sort of develop and blossom and be discovered. And I'm very interested in that symbiotic relationship between the private and, and public art space. Well, Anna, can I just ask you to continue on that path then through the lens of another one of the big subjects we want to talk about today, which is inflation, which has been like a huge, huge story this year. So. Felix, I, I'll let you kind of get into the details of this. I feel like you're going to know the numbers better than I do. But um, broadly speaking, I think everybody in the room knows that we are in a high inflationary environment in the U.S. And the flip side to that is that in theory, if you were a philanthropist and you were looking to donate money abroad somewhere to an institution, like shouldn't your money go further? Could that be a good thing? Like how does this end up translating on the, the nonprofit giving side of things? 
So, so much going on there. Um, so the first thing, yeah, no, like by, by Latin American standards, we do not have high inflation in the right. United States. Yeah. Um, and, and it's coming down, like, you know, so I, the, there is a wonderful silver lining in the art world to inflation, um, which, which is about this whole question of especially for-profit galleries who um, have this convention that whenever you show an artist, you're never allowed to reduce their price. Don't ask me why this convention exists. It's a convention. We can, we all, you know, we can love it or hate it, but whatever it is, it, it's it's there. But that's a nominal convention, right? And so what the um, inf what inflation gives you is the ability to reduce an artist's price in real terms without reducing it in nominal terms, and being able to go to, to ebb and flow a bit in terms of prices is actually awesome. Um, in, the, in terms of um, being able to re respond to market conditions and, and be active in the market and smart. So I like that aspect. You know, like it's, um, but uh, wait, what was your question? I totally forgot your question. <laughs> I, I think you stole my question, actually. <laughs> yeah, you kind of dove in front of that like a Secret Service agent, like somebody's taking a shot of the president. It's kind of amazing. But <laughs> um, let's, let's, just, let's just pin that there. And, and I want to give you a chance to talk about the, the kind of institutional side of, of inflation, how that affects things. I think that most philanthropists take a pretty long-term vision with what they're choosing to support. I don't think on a technical basis they're saying, oh, great, like Latin America's cheap right now. Let's go build a museum there. And I hope not because that would be oh, really wait, depressing. that was oh. your question. <laughs> I He's doing it again. <laughs> no, no, but, but very, very quickly. We have, we have inflation, but we also, this is very rare in, in financial markets, so we should, like, you know, make sure to point this out. We also have an incredibly strong dollar. This is a, a rare combination. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You're spending dollars outside the United States. They go really far right now. Totally, and I think that people who are in the humanitarian sector have understood that for decades, and that's why you see so much philanthropy around uh, world hunger and things like that happening. But I will point out, a lot of times it's happening through U.S. nonprofits because our entire philanthropic system here is extraordinarily well developed because our tax system highly encourages this kind of giving. And I think that um, I can certainly see a scenario in which um, more people are interested in philanthropy in the global south, but again, are gonna be thinking about both the most tax efficient way to do it and also the most, um, I guess, like fiduciarily safe way of doing it because we also have a nonprofit sector that's very scrutinized here. Um, I think a segue, I wanted to bring this back a little bit to my broader work in impact investing. And there's and impact investing, for those of you who are not familiar, is this concept that you can both invest for financial returns, but also for returns that benefit people and the planet. And there is a lot of interest in impact investing in the global south. The global south is this place that's like greatly in fact impacted by climate change. It's impacted by um, wealth disparity and social unrest. And I think that applying this impact investing mindset um, puts people in a position, position where in the long term can also benefit the art market. Because if you're making investments that are improving sort of social dynamics in the country, you're ending up in a situation where you have more buyers, where you don't just have the highest levels of society that have access to art markets. And you know, I, I really kind of encourage my clients to be thinking about both their roles as investors and philanthropists and sort of being cohesive with that approach. Um, Omara and Leopold, how does this whole idea of like a strong dollar impact the way that you do your business day to day because you're you're you have spaces either permanently or temporarily in multiple countries you have artists who are living in various countries you're converting money all the time you're charging different uh, different collectors the same price like how does this all factor in how do you think through all this it seems like a nightmare it is okay. no it is a double edged sword because um it is great to have a strong dollar uh, when you are um, when you're selling to international clients, but when you're developing your local market, it is a nightmare because suddenly one day your clients woke up and they are 20% less rich. <laughs> so it's very complex, and when you have when you're dealing, we had this. Uh, I've already been through these before, and in 2018 when there was this crash of oil. There was a collapse, all of the clients were going crazy. What are we gonna do? We cannot 
pay and we cannot buy. Uh, we had to develop a strategy so we can keep uh, making business uh, with them at special exchange rate, uh, trying to mitigate um, the impact of the, um, of the dollar uh, for us, of course. Um, so it is, it is tricky because now most of our artists live outside Colombia. So I cannot sell in Colombian pesos and then pay my artists in US dollars because I'm going to lose a lot of money. So it is, a very, it is very complex. It is, for us, fortunately, most of our clients are located outside. So that means that uh, most of our business uh, stays the same uh, and it's benefited by by the strong US dollar. But of course, for the local market, it is very complex. And we always were trying to, because it, I cannot just say, well, I don't care about these collectors anymore. I'm just going to focus outside. And I cannot do that also for the Colombian artists as well. So it's a, it's a conversation. It's a dialogue. I, I sit down, and I, I think a lot of artists understand the moment. And when. We, we just had the fair in Bogota, and I sat down with all of them, and I told them, we're going to need to have these prices for these clients. And they were like, yes, let's do it. So it's, I think it's just uh, the most transparent you are with your artists, and you sit down and have these conversations, and they understand that it's for the benefit of the artwork and of everybody. Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a challenge, but it can be overcome. Yes, uh, well, uh, same situation, and um, I, I was, um, the first time we talk a team about inflation rates and recessive context, um, I realized that almost all, almost all my professional life I lived with inflation rate in Argentina, you know, um, starting in 10%, and nowadays going to a 100% inflation rate in a year. And uh, that gave us uh, this kind of uh, dynamic uh, that Felix was describing, you know, of uh, a power of adaptation that uh, has some advantages. And um, I, would, I would say after many years of, you know, waving of, <laughs> you know, uh, being part of this, this uh, dynamic economy, that even inflation rate wouldn't be as bad if... Um, if you have a growing economy, you know, paired. Um, because even when you have more production, employment is generated, you know, inflation can be somehow, you know, uh, compensated with some augmentations of salaries or, and other stuff. But, um, but I, I keep on thinking on the title of this, of this conversation that is growing sideways and I really feel like partnered with Omaira, and I, I, can, I can say that our programs are somehow based on this idea of having a strategy of growing a way that is not the, the main or the supposed way to grow, you know? And um, I think we, uh, let me talk by you because uh, we are we are kind of brothers in in this. Uh, the programs are really are really can yes. match uh, a lot. And um, and Felix said about this idea of, of you don't you cannot have a gallery if you don't have a deep pocket. <laughs> and uh, and I must say that ten years ago when Isla Flotante started, the main income of the gallery was selling beers at the Bernissage. <laughs> and uh, and now you know. Uh, we are not a big, big thing, but we can afford this kind of fares. And, um, and that was really because we had a, 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 an idea of growing sideways and, and this strong idea for our, for our project to accumulate you know, uh, money in order to have a reserve to face all our commitments and all our dreams, you know, what we, we want to do and no, not what the, the world imposed us, we are meant to, to do or have. Yeah, I also want to say that because when you were talking, I was like, well, I don't have big pockets <laughs> just yet, and we've been open since 2014. I think it is what Leopoldo is talking about. I think you have to really 
be very smart on the way of, to be a young gallery today or a mid-career gallery when you are competing with these huge blue ship um, mega galleries that, have, that can come in and take your artists and you're like, okay, bye. Uh, but, uh, but it does take, um, I think, a lot of conviction and intelligence to be able to run uh, the gallery with an uneven cash flow because, of course, as you say, this is a home run business and sometimes you make big, big sales and there's a month that you sold $2,000. Uh, so it just, uh, it's required to adapt to the times and I think uh, there is a new generation and I think like Leopoldo's gallery and uh, a lot of other galleries, younger galleries, that we come from uh, also a conviction of within the art and what it means to sell art is not just, we're not just art dealers. It's, it's different. We're not here only to make business and sell big numbers who are committed with our artists and we're, our, our programs talk about who we are and what we wanna say. And I think uh, collectors and institutions are really interested in that. So that allows us to grow, even though I cannot sit on an artwork for 10 years and then sell it whenever uh, the best uh, buyer comes around. I have other means to, we have other means to keep going and keep the cash flow and uh, go through the times and, and keep growing. The other kind of big flashing red light in the economic discussion this year has been the prospect of recession, which is something I've now been hearing about at every art world event that I've gone to for the past six months or so. And it, like I've described the second half of this year as this giant game of hot potato where every time there's a new event, people are like, oh no, oh no, oh no, it's gonna fall apart. Oh, it didn't fall apart, now it's your turn. <laughs> and I, there's a lot of directions we can go with this, but I'm, as I was thinking about this panel and this particular part of the cycle that we may be entering again, I remember the early stages of the pandemic and one of the things that really sticks out to me at that point when I was reading all these headlines about all these museums that were struggling because they were closed to the public for obvious reasons. And one of the things I kept hearing people who were not in the philanthropic side of the art industry say is, well, the donors just should give more. Like, just the rich people should just give more money. That's, that's how you solve this. And I was like, is it that easy? Is that how they think about it? Like, Anna, as somebody who deals with, like, institutional investments, uh, families that are thinking about nonprofit donations, like, how does the, the prospect of entering a recession tend to affect the way that people think about how they give to arts causes? Sure. I mean, I think what we actually did see during COVID was a lot of um, long-time donors to institutions really did step up for their institutions. The problem we're seeing now is a lot of this COVID, uh, big push for COVID funding we're seeing start to dwindle and institutions are starting to scramble for budgets once again. But philanthropic giving isn't divorced from what happens in the economy more broadly. Um, as a going rate, it's about 2% of GDP a year. And when you're in a recessionary scenario, it can drop by almost as much as 15%. I think you have to look at where institutions are really funded from. We're um, kind of in a scenario where some, some institutions are much more funded by major gifts versus like ongoing general membership. That ongoing general membership pool is very sensitive to recessions. The major gifts pool feels it, but is at the end of the day gonna come through and honor um, commitments that they've made. Uh, that being said, in talking to the nonprofit sector, um, I've heard executive directors model out various scenarios for budgets, one where you know, these gifts they've been relying on for a long time just might not come through this year. Uh, if they're lucky enough to have endowments, they're also coming to the realization that 5% plus inflation, which used to be the benchmark kind of return target for a lot of organizations, is probably not a realistic target in the next maybe five or seven year period. So they're really having to reassess sort of their sources of funds. Um, but it was interesting, you know, arts giving during COVID uh, really fell off. It was down like 8%. Um, it was one of the few sectors that actually saw less giving during COVID um, than more because uh, American philanthropy really, really stepped up during the pandemic. So, you know, you do see this. People start to fund immediate needs. People start to fund humanitarian causes and the arts kind of do get left behind, which comes back to that point of the arts needing to make themselves increasingly relevant in these kind of situations of precarity. 
Felix, out of curiosity, when you're looking at sort of how the financial markets tend to deal with recessions, are, are there any lessons that you can draw from that and apply to the art world in any kind of way? I think, I think the first thing I want to say um, is it has been 20 years, more than 20 years now, since we have seen a remotely normal recession. Like, most people barely remember what a recession actually looks like. We had a global financial crisis, which is, you know, a kind of massive recession on steroids, which hits everyone really hard. We had a global pandemic, which we all know what happened there, and, like, the entire world just came to a screeching halt for a period of, you know, months, and we still haven't really come out the end of that. What we haven't had is just a normal recession. And when people start talking about recessions, you know, especially when you know, Morgan Stanley or someone like that starts talking about recessions, they are not talking about that. If someone is saying, like, oh, no, we're, you know, there, there could be a recession in the next six months or year or whatever, that is not what they are talking about. They're not talking about a financial crisis. They're not talking about a pandemic. They're talking about, I don't know if anyone remembers the last time we had a recession in the United States. It was like 2001, you know? Um, Probably you don't remember it because you had a perfectly good job or, you know, if you were if you're still, you know, even an adult then. And it was fine. You know, unless you were in Silicon Valley or you had a huge amount of money in tech stocks, you, you didn't really notice it. And certainly the art market didn't really notice it. So a recession in and of itself is not a super scary thing. And in fact, if there is going to be a recession right now, and it's not clear that there will be, it's kind of looking like it will be a sort of 2001 style recession, um, you know, with tech companies feeling the brunt of it, you know, fine. I, I don't think that's um, particularly worrying to, to, to an art crowd. I actually like had a point to add on this. On the philanthropic side, a lot of these kind of long-term donors are people who've already established foundations. There's like a pool of philanthropic money it's set aside, you know, in a given year you might have a slightly less high financial return, so fine, you have a slightly smaller pot of money to give away. In a recessionary context, I think the way philanthropy is affected is this general slowdown in economic activity on the whole less mergers and acquisitions, less IPOs, less like wealth creation moments where people are putting aside a big chunk of money because they're trying to offset a taxable gain. So I think new donors are going to be a little scarce, but you know, the old time philanthropy yeah. establishment is here. W one of the things we should mention is that there has been this big move in philanthropy towards, as you say, foundations, donor advised funds, um, We've had a huge number of these things that the financial markets love to call liquidity events, basically when people get really rich very suddenly. Um, and when people get really rich very suddenly, they don't just give that money to charity. They, give that, they put that money into a box, and then they're like, I will trickle money out of that box sort of in the future. If the amount of money going into boxes slows down, that doesn't necessarily mean that the m amount of money coming out of the existing boxes is going to slow down massively. You know, it, the, there are a lot of complaints about d donor advised funds and foundations and stuff about how they do provide this, you know, that the, the money isn't going really to where it's needed, it's just going into investments. But the flip side of that is that when you have a recession, the boxes are still the boxes and they still have lots of money in them. I can't wait the next time somebody brings up recession at the end to be like, what you need to understand is that the boxes are still the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and are you going to say something else? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say there's also a misconception that people kind of aren't charitable. Like something we saw happening a lot during COVID was found foundations are kind of mandated to pay out 5% a year, but a lot of the foundations I work with were what's called overspending. So they were committing to paying 6 or 8%. In a year, or suddenly there was these conversations around spend down that started happening a lot more often. Like maybe we should we shouldn't keep the money in the boxes perpetually <laughs> and, and take a you know 10-year period to pay it down. And even the donor advised funds, like they actually have a relatively high payout rate. It's actually about 20%. So even though they're not mandated to give, I think a lot of people who set these things up like do feel socially responsible and are distri distributing those funds. I want to ask. Omira and Leopold about the kind of psychological side of this because you, I'll say this, I am of a generation where like I was not working when we had that last normal recession that Felix had and, or that Felix was talking about. 
And obviously, I think that you're both sort of part of a generation of gallerists who maybe were not even really getting started at that point either. And so the only types of recessions that you've known are these sort of like life-altering existential crises. So when you start to get this sense that things may be slowing down, like how do you think through that? Do you, does it just seem like it could be the end of everything? Or are you just like, well, I need to cut back and be a little smarter about how I do things and probably everything will be okay. Uh, I'm holding on to a phrase uh, by Winston Churchill, um, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think everything will be shut down and will end and uh, I will go cry in a corner. Um, I think, uh, no, I think you just have to be smart. Of course, clients will feel, I think more is a psychological thing than an actual, uh, as uh, Felix was saying, like, it's just the nerve of the idea of a recession. It's just like a boogeyman uh, in the terms of, of expanding because it's the, the same happened with the pandemic. You know, we saw like, oh my God, what are we gonna do without our fares, the market? And we did great. <laughs> we did great. So this was uh, this was a like a reminder that we can just like pull through and just be smart in the way that you spend and where you're going. And this is also anyway with recession or not recession. That's the way like we approach every year on how we're planning our our, our fairs and our projects. So. I, I think we'll be fine, just need to like cut down on certain, um, yeah, spending that are not, not necessary or they're not really impactful for the growth of the gallery, which is the focus uh, right now. Can, can, I, can I just mention here that we, we've just been through this incredible, you know, terrifying pandemic. If you survive the pandemic, you will be fine through like any forthcoming potential recession. We have you know, in this room, in this fair, a whole bunch of survivorship bias, right? Not everyone survived the pandemic. Um, the people who managed to, you know, fly to Miami and sit on stage here are the people who did survive the, the pandemic, and that's great. But, like, yeah, once you, if you survived the pandemic, you are, you should pat yourself on the back, congratulate yourself, and not worry about a recession. This um, team, um, you know, I wouldn't say that everything's going to fall apart, and I, I wouldn't even be afraid, you know, because uh, we've proven that uh, we can survive with almost nothing. And once you you do that, you know, uh, it's anything can be scared at all. Uh, obviously, you need to manage, you know, and be smart, as Amaya says. But I guess that's much more like a psychological status that uh, obviously affect us because we are human beings, as all, as all of us. But I think we have this... Uh, incredibly good thing that is this enthusiasm you know of of um, having a program that it's intended to rebate this idea that there is a, just one way of growing one way of developing you know and uh, if you are in the south then uh, it wouldn't come up you know and uh, this enthusiasm that is core of both programs and many of our galleries uh, for our generation, I think keeps us, uh, you know, um, keeps us to, together in order to, to have a clear mind and keep on going. I'm gonna try to get us into one more topic before we open it up to the audience for questions. And so Felix, when you and I were talking about what you were interested in, in the art market, right now. One of the things that I think you and I both agree on is this notion of artists becoming more and more active participants in their own markets in various ways. And I'm wondering if your the, the kind of general economic outlook of things right now, how does that play in? Do you, I mean, it sounds more like now you're saying, if we're gonna have a recession, it's not gonna be a big deal, so there's not gonna be a huge existential crisis, and it's not like artists are gonna be like, aha, this is the moment I've been waiting for, now I can seize all the rest of the power from my dealer and just do everything the way that I wanna do it. But I don't wanna put words in your mouth either, so like, what do you think? What, where's this headed? No, I think, I think it's actually the opposite. I, th I think that, um, 
artists tend to, you know, seize the means of production, as it were, um, in bull markets rather than bear markets. You, you, the, a, a certain small proportion of artists aspires to being, you know, capitalist business owners. And when they have a, a tailwind of collectors coming behind them and saying, yeah, I want to buy your stuff, and they feel that they don't need a gallery to introduce themselves, to introduce them to those collectors, so they have those collectors already, and they have a bunch of income coming in, that's, and, and they can see, like, a rosy future, that's when they, you know, set up companies and become, you know, Damien Hurst and become, like, an industry unto themselves. Um, you know, we, we've had this very uh, bullish art market for a few years, and that's exactly the kind of market where, you know, where Tom Sachs is going to come out and say, I'm going to set up at my own company and do it all myself. Um, I do think that in slower periods, in downturns, that's when artists increasingly start to feel more of the benefits that come from having a, you know, home. Then again, it's also when galleries start thinking, shit, we had we have too many artists. We might need to drop one or two. Uh, just to kind of stay on this same topic, but to shift gears, um, Anna, I'm wondering if in your experience in the kind of philanthropic side of things, you've seen anything new come up that sort of is artist-driven in one way or another or that is, uh, I don't know, maybe a new phase of a way to think through how... I don't know, artists can maybe drive nonprofit giving or, or nonprofit causes in ways that they otherwise wouldn't in the past. I think one of my favorite recent examples of this is around the artist Charles Gaines, who just had a big project open with Creative Time mm -hmm. in New York. And uh, at Freeze New York last year, Hauser and Worth had a booth of Charles Gaines' work. And basically, a deal was sort of worked out between Hauser and Creative Time that instead of having collectors take their sort of standard 10% discount, they were encouraged to write a check to Creative Time for that amount of money and support this project. And net-net, pretty much virtually everyone was on board to do this. They got a tax deduction for making that gift. And they raised over $700,000 to get this major project done. By the way, Charles has a film premiering with Art21, I think, tonight. So uh, anyway, uh, one of my favorite artists and a great artist to follow. All I'm saying is all these gallery, galleries have a vested interest in institutional partnerships because that raises the profile of their artists and vice versa, you know, more attention from an artist that's stimulated by a gallery raises awareness for a nonprofit. I think that this is a model that can really widely be adopted across the arts ecosystem. The other two examples I can think of, I think what Nan Golden did at the Guggenheim and her advocacy around um, where money for institutions is coming from and the way that's like virtually changed the way museums think about board development has been really um, impactful. It's something I've been really following over the last couple of years and I think the next phase of this and like out of my own self-interest is no one is talking about how museums are investing really, but they control like $60 billion of capital. And if, I think if people start asking more questions about what museums act, are actually doing with their money, we can see museums take on a much broader role in terms of the broader social and environmental ecosystem. And are there, um, you talked earlier about impact investments. Um, are there ways that museum endowments and other, and, and family offices or whoever, can invest their money in a way that positively impacts the art world, that, you know, rather than just spending that 5%? I mean, sure, the creative economy like actually encompasses a really wide array of businesses that's not just like commercial galleries, but also includes the film production business and sustainable agriculture. And I think that like it's an area of increasing interest for investors. We also do a lot of work in affordable housing and where affordable housing projects are bringing in arts and culture programming to benefit residents. So yeah, there's investable opportunities, so to speak. Well, looking at the clock, I think that we have by now done a pretty good job of living up to my expectations. We're gonna cover a lot of ground. And so I am going to open up questions to the audience at this point. Please raise your hand if you'd like to ask anything and we'll come around with the mic. Hi, my name is Sutka. I have an art gallery in New York, uh, in Boston. And my question is, uh, what do you think of selling online 
And uh, what are the uh, online uh, companies that you would recommend if you choose to? Yeah, could you could you speak I'm into sorry. the mic a little more directly, please? I, the question is, uh, what do you think of selling art online? And um, any uh, online companies that you would uh, recommend? Well, I think that um, online sales are part of are a part, you know, of the art market. Uh, we have uh, numbers very similar on the annual report that Art Basel makes. It's around seven to eight percent of income, of sales, and um, I would say that that is it's one part of the business. You know, uh, I during pandemics, obviously, it was a, had a protagonic uh, situation, but uh, I still feel that. Uh, uh, collectors and buyers, they are always, you know, um, trying to get this physical experience with the works that uh, necessarily you can see it in the fair. You, uh, it's, it's another, you know, uh, it's a layer that cannot be avoided. So, yeah, I, I would say that uh, pandemics uh, gave us the opportunity to learn more about selling online and to use it more effectively. Uh, that was a really good thing. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so earlier Felix mentioned how real estate and art are kind of similar in the sense that I'm guessing it's a perceived value and how, how much they cost. Well, I just wanted to know like what's the real connection with art and real estate being kind of similar? That was a heavy sigh. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for saying it's, it's uh, yeah. Um, no, they're not, they're not, well, it, so the first thing, and I've had this conversation with Tim, and, and it's a perennial um, question in the art world, is, is an artwork a consumption good, or is it an investment? Um, and Anna was saying that, like, a lot of her clients think of it as an investment, um, and I guess they kind of, like, mentally mark it to roughly where they bought it, or something like that. Um, I can tell you for myself that whenever I buy an artwork, I always mentally mark it to zero. Um, but yeah, if it's a if it's a consumption good, if it's something you're buying to make your life, you know, happier just because you're consuming it, then um, then it's just like that money is gone. If it's an investment, then you're you're kind of thinking that money might increase. And in that sense, I think it's similar to real estate, because it is both something that you are consuming, it's shelter that you are consuming, you know, we all, we all have this, you know, short position in shelter that we need to cover that short, we need to, you know, find a place to stay every night. Um, and once we've consumed that, like, you know, the place I stayed last night, that's gone, that's in the past, that's consumed. But it is also just an incredibly important part of wealth creation in the world, right? That especially if you look for, middle, for the middle classes, the vast majority of wealth people have is generally tied up in real estate. And so it is also an investment. Um, and that kind of tension between, you know, how much am I paying to buy shelter and how much am I investing in something that might actually go up in value and improve my net worth? Is, is definitely common between the two. Uh, yes, in the back. You, uh, we talk about real estate, which is an interesting... Uh, if you see artwork tied to real estate, does that make the real estate, um, the price of that real estate go up and down if that piece of art is attached to the real estate? Oh yes, like the warehouse with the Banksy on the side, right? <laughs> It does happen. I think that artists have been really essential in like this concept of creative placemaking and like making neighborhoods happen for a long time. In fact, they've been like co-opted in this capacity for a long time. Um, I don't know. I think I also think to the earlier question, art and real estate trade in very similar ways. They're both like illiquid markets. Um, they're about aesthetics. They're about feeling. I don't know. I, I think that's why there's always been a legacy of real estate investors who are active art collectors. It's sort of is the same part of the brain, I think. Yeah. Do you have an eye for it, you know? <laughs> I, 
I would also just add to that if you haven't already read it, there is a New Yorker profile of Theaster Gates from maybe 2014 or 2015 that's actually just headlined the real estate artist. And it's just all about his practice and how it's tied up in various actual real estate investments and how it uh, he's sort of filtered that into making work and filtered the work back into building up neighborhoods. And it's, it's a super interesting read. So I would recommend that to anybody who's interested. Um, it's not a question, but amazing talk. And I just go out of here being very positive after Felix's approach to recession. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Be happy. Who knew this was going to be a feel-good panel? And here we are. Uh, anyone else? Do any of you have any questions for each other that you would like to ask? It's cool if the answer is no. We can all just break early. Yeah. Hit the bar. Yeah. Thank you, Tim, for bringing us together. Hey. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks thank you, everybody. You. Please, round of applause for everybody up here. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience. Thanks to Art Basel, and we will see you around. Thanks.